we present the news quiz with your host, Miles Jump. Hello and welcome to the news quiz. We start with a cutting from the Visit Wales website read by Cathy Clugston. Short breaks in Wales are never too long. Within a few hours you can be shopping in Cardiff's arcades, getting out the bucket and spade or pulling on your helmet for 48 hours of gripping weekend adventure. (laughs) Our thanks to Alan Johnson in Clandilo for sending that muck in. Uh, (laughs) Now, let's meet the teams. Will you welcome first, on my right, Hugo Rifkind and Lucy Porter. And opposite them, on my left, Samira Ahmed and Jeremy Hardy. So, Hugo, um, who's written a book? (laughs) Might as well keep it simple. Who's who's written a book? Who's written a book? Uh, Well, this is Lord Ashcroft, I'd imagine. Lord Ashcroft's uh, biography of David Cameron which has gathered quite a lot of headlines this week because it includes some quite sensational claims, uh, (laughs) some of which may be true, some of which might not be true. And you might be thinking to yourself, how can a book include claims that might not be true? You know, why does, for example, being sued hold no fears for the billionaire Lord Ashcroft? (laughs) Um, And indeed, his publisher, how do the people who work at his publisher and who commissioned this particular book how did they manage to get the whole project past the man who owns the publisher, who is the billionaire Lord Ashcroft? <laughs> um, and, and these are questions, alas, to which I just have no answer. Uh, but I can give you the, the backstory. basically, is that Lord Ashcroft, he was the Tory party treasurer. He gave millions of pounds to the party before the 2010 election. And it's reasonable to assume that off the back of this, he expected to get a decent job in government, not least because he said he did. Um, but, but he didn't. He got offered the j- a job of being a junior whip in the Foreign Office, and so he sort of walked off in a bit of a huff. And it's pretty reasonable to assume he's written this book by means of revenge. Uh, now, there are some quite important claims in here. There's one, for example, that, um, that ought to capture our attention, which is the idea that Cameron knew about Ashcroft's non-DOM status long before it's been said that he did. And that's the sort of thing we've been really trying to concentrate on this week <laughs> in the media, um, over the sound of this sort of background rattling hum that sort of goes, knob in a pig, knob in a pig, knob in a pig. <laughs> and, um, and, and you try and put it to the back of your mind. You really do. You try and get over it. And you go, no, but this is really significant because there was a particular date in November of 2000 and knob in a pig, knob in a pig. <laughs> and I mean, you, you just cannot concentrate on anything else. It's impossible to, to look at camera now without thinking knob in a pig, knob in a pig, knob in a pig. Um, and, I mean, what's the, point? what's the point of anything? What's the point of a satirical news show when you can go on Question Time and say, do you think the Prime Minister put his knob in a pig? <laughs> um, yeah, every, everything is topsy-turvy. <laughs> everything is disjoint and out of frame. But they didn't do PMQs this week, did they? Or they done it? No. 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 Oh, because that would have been... You could have sent so many things into Jeremy, couldn't you? That you could have read out. <laughs> the owner of a prize-winning sow in Cumbria... <laughs> would like the Prime Minister to say if he has any plans to go to Cockermouth. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the, the best thing was that when they said that they would not dignify it, and you think, well, that means it's true, doesn't it? <laughs> and they say, I'm not, I'm not even going to dignify that truth. And, of course, a lot of um, <laughs> Tory MPs from rural constituencies are urgently seeking reassurances <laughs> that, that the pig was A, British, and B, female. <laughs> <laughs> but then, then there's people, a lot of people who are at Oxford saying, I was a doctor to that, I was involved in various drinking clubs and so forth, and no such initiation ritual exists. You think, and then he hasn't even got an excuse. <laughs> <laughs> if, if it wasn't even expected... I mean, it's one thing if it's some kind of insane bit of ridiculous yes. protocol, like singing the national anthem, that you just have to kind of get through. But if he just did it on his own initiative... Yeah. That really is. And then people say, well, we've all done stupid things at university. Yeah, but, you know, nicking a traffic cone is not... You know, even when you're really drunk, it's not the same as popping into the old pig's head for a spritzer, is it? <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was, I, was um, I, I found I was reading the news and I was in bed on my phone going through Twitter and I sort of saw it and I sort of swore quite loudly and my wife woke up and she goes, what's happened? And I was like, oh, it's just the news. And she goes, is it a bomb? And I heard myself say, no, it's worse than that. <laughs> <laughs> but you compare it to Jeremy Corbyn. There have been a lot of complaints to the BBC saying all the kind of attempts to slander Jeremy oh. Corbyn and, you know going on holiday in East Germany, having sex with another consenting adult, outrageous. But this isn't really getting reported. But then, you know, what can you say on air about this? <laughs> but I don't think outside of Britain anyone really knows about this. And certainly it's, 
No one's talking about it. I tried to find a single American network where they might have discussed it, but the only thing that disgusts them, it's not kind of mass violence and massacres, it's the idea of anything to do with sex. And I think it was Harry Kunzer in the um, New York Times said, and he told his American friends, they all went, oh, my God, the germs. <laughs> <laughs> well, exactly. Let's hope he was wearing a non-dom at the time. <laughs> There's a lot of worse stuff in that book. I went through to see what else Michael Ashcroft had found, and I was really shocked. He liked snooker, (laughs) midsummer murders, and, quote, he went to see the crude Sasha Baron Cohen movie Borat and laughed throughout. (laughs) (laughs) Can I just raise it? I mean, I do actually feel a bit weird about talking about this because I do feel it's not him so much. It's his children. I just feel really sorry for his children. I just think it's a real... You know, they're sitting there on their own in a pub somewhere. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Just... Gazing at the pork scratchings, thinking, you know... <laughs> no, I, I do think it's a bit... I don't know, I just feel a bit... Ugh, about it, the whole thing. It's also important to sort of remember that he probably didn't actually do it. You yes. know, I mean, this is, this, is, this, is, <laughs> you know, this is an angry man who didn't get a job who's written a book accusing yeah. him of this ridiculous thing that everyone's now slagging him off for, and he probably didn't actually do it. But still very funny, but still probably <laughs> didn't actually do yeah. it. Yeah. Well, who is the source? You must know. You're a journalist. No, uh, I don't. And I wouldn't tell you if I did. I'd totally tell you if I did. Uh, but I don't know. No, it's, it says in the book that it is a Conservative MP who was at Oxford at the same time as Cameron. I'm sure we're fine here on legal grounds. Who, who probably was the source? <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't you wonder if it had been Boris that it would all have been presented differently? Well, of course I did. Of course I... Come on, we've all done it, haven't we? <laughs> What's the Latin word for it? I, uh, uh. Uh, indeed. Uh, extraordinarily, this is the Daily Mail serialisation of a new book by former Conservative Party treasurer and cat-stroking Bond villain Lord Ashcroft. Uh, the book is a biography of David Cameron, a man who apparently likes his bacon crispy around the edges and moist in the middle. And, <laughs> and is believed to be motivated by a desire for revenge after Cameron failed to offer him a significant government position. Uh, Perhaps the biggest shock in all this is that Lord Ashcroft has written something that I'm actually interested in reading. (laughs) Of course, some of the more lurid allegations in the book could just be a tactical leak designed to remind us all that Jeremy Corbyn is a vegetarian and thus (laughs) completely out of touch with the hopes and aspirations of ordinary, hard-working people. (laughs) Many of whom would love to be able to lay their hands on a pig's head and have the chance to violate it. Um, (laughs) Keep dreaming, you strivers. Um, (laughs) Two points to Hugo... Lucy, uh, who has made a sin of emission? Yes, this is the uh, Rosprung durch Betrugen, or uh, Progress Through Cheating. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> the story of... I mean, think for years, all of us, we've wondered, how do the Germans manage to make their cars so reliable, efficient and environmentally friendly? And uh, now we found out the answer is they don't. Uh, they just lie. So, yes, American researchers, this is VW, obviously the other German car manufacturers probably above reproach, but VW have been found to be cheating. The American researchers found that their diesel model, models were emitting 20 to 40 times more nitrogen oxide pollution than the company claimed because they'd been fitting, and they've admitted now, they fitted 482,000 Audis and Volkswagens with defeat devices. Which are basically, uh, it's a device that allows the vehicle's computer to know when it's being tested, and so then it performs at a much lower capacity, which actually is a lot like my brain, as my A-level results will attest. It, it is, it is a, a bit unfair, this notion that, like, the problem is that there are these, the tests that, that they do to measure the emissions, and they have, they have nothing to do with sort of normal driving experience. But that's pretty normal with driving, because your driving test has nothing to do with normal driving experience. <laughs> You're never going to reverse around a corner. You're never going to have to parallel park without slightly crashing into the car. You'd never give a lift to a man with a clipboard. Exactly. <laughs> You're never, never going to drive without swearing. Yeah. Um, 
but we, but we, we sort of labour under this sort of EU-sponsored fiction that that's what driving's really like, and it's just not. I drove a VW Golf about 10 years ago, and they couldn't even get the cup holder in the right place then. So uh, this is... <laughs> it's come on uh, somewhat. But uh, So, yeah, there's uh, 11 million cars, they think, have been fitted with these devices. The problems come to light in America, but they think, actually, it's, you know, it's entirely likely that it's happened in Europe. But um, one of the things that's emerged is that the EU has much lower standards for air pollution testing than the US, which is incredible because I've been to LA, which is basically just smog central. And it turns out, like, you know, compared to them, we've been living in the equivalent of Keith Richards' lungs. Uh, <laughs> you know. And it's just this sheer kind of the brazenness of it as well. I didn't realise that the car manufacturers get to decide who tests their cars and there's not really any great oversight. You know, this has just been fine for years. They just go, oh, yeah, it's fine. The cars are fine. Yeah, it's no problem. You know, and then you just imagine someone coming up and going, <coughs> yes, this is fab. We do not need to test anymore. <laughs> French uh, testers there. <laughs> <laughs> it is a conspiracy, though, that America has stricter uh, tests on emissions because um, America is only stricter for diesels, for nitrogen dioxide emissions that you get from diesels. They don't give a toss about CO2, which is what warms the planet. Mm. And the reason why they care about diesels is because pretty much all diesel cars in America are imported from Europe. And so one of the reasons why they're going so big on this, and they should be, it's a con, obviously, Mm. but one of the reasons why they're going so big on this is to squash European imports so Uh, they can have their own ridiculous gas-guzzling cars there instead. uh, Well, I'm not worried at all because I drive an Audi. Isn't the whole reason that we have so many diesel cars because they just had, like, there was a load of cheap diesel in the 90s and so they just went, oh, have that. Oh, it, and, well, uh, we can blame Tony Blair for this. Oh, good. Does anyone know? <laughs> just, just, well, just on general principles. Yeah. Just, because, uh, yes, because they encouraged... A bit, well, possibly, not unreasonably, they were more worried about CO2 emissions because of, you know, that was what we worried about in the 90s. That was, it was all 90s. It was all, you know, colour change T-shirts and Nirvana... And greenhouse gases, that was what we were into back then. <laughs> so uh, we danced to. That was, <laughs> that was our thing. But so they sort of thought, well, actually, you know, maybe the... I, I, was, I keep saying nitrous oxide, which is not the right gas, is it? <laughs> That's fun. That's is the that, fun one. Is it? Nitrous oxide is laughing gas, yes. This oh, is nitrogen nice. oxide. But, yeah, so they sort of thought, well, we'll sacrifice people in the short term for the sake of the planet in the long well, run. Well, they That's thought diesel enough. was greener. That was what we because were told. VW were telling them that thought, it was. Yeah. Well, I've made a conscious decision because it is better for climate change, which affects my daughter and her future, her children, future generations. Whereas I've got asthma, so I'm prime candidate to suffer from breathing in diesel. So I figure that I'm sacrificing my life by, by breathing <laughs> diesel for future generations in a way. You are self, and it's so much cheaper. <laughs> oh. <laughs> How uh, big a scandal do we think this is um, on a scale of one to? Putting your willy in a pig's mouth. (laughs) (laughs) About a seven? It's it's pretty big. It's quite Uh, easy to falsify emissions. All you have to do is blame the dog. (laughs) (laughs) Well, uh, appallingly, this is the news that Volkswagen have admitted installing software in their diesel cars designed to cheat US emissions tests, making the cars seem much more environmentally friendly than they actually are. The BBC reported that the scandal could hit 11 million vehicles, much like a Sunday afternoon drive with George Michael. (laughs) One German newspaper has called it the most expensive act of stupidity in the history of the car industry, but I think we should probably reserve judgment until we've seen the new Top Gear. Uh, (laughs) Two points to Lucy. (laughs) Samira, have a listen to this. Well, that has left us all very emotional. Um, (laughs) Samira, who this week held China in their hand? (laughs) Lord. Um, You know, Chancellor George Osborne went to China on a big trade mission and has announced all these plans to get them to invest in this massive uh, nuclear plant they want to build, um, Hinkley C, and is talking about doing kind of link-ups and stock market in bonds, even though there's been this massive slump in the Chinese stock market. But also he's putting in all this money into promoting British culture. They're spending a million pounds on a, a British culture is great slogan campaign out there. And 
I got an interview with him. They, they, his, his department rang up Front Row and said, oh, you know, he's a fan of Front Row. I'd like to come on and talk about it. So, you know, we had this exclusive interview and it was going to be this big story on Monday. And then <laughs> something else happened. And, I, and I, I, put, <laughs> I, I put a link on Facebook to all my friends and I said, yeah, I've got this interview with George Osborne. And they, they said, sadly, I think we'll all still be talking about pigs. <laughs> <laughs> but the controversy, the accusation is that this government is too interested in trying to do business deals with China and not interested enough in challenging them over their appalling and worsening human rights record and their treatment of people like Ai Weiwei, whose visa initially was turned down when he applied for a visa to come to his own show at the Royal Academy. And some people say the reason it got turned down was there's this assumption in the Foreign Office that the government wouldn't want to do anything to offend the Chinese. Now, George Osborne said it's a mistake, but it's interesting that such a mistake was even allowed to happen in a way. And the other appalling example was, you know, when the market started to crash um, and shares slumped 40%, there was a, a journalist who was, you know, reporting on it and talking about why this might be happening. And he was arrested and interrogated and paraded on television to apologise for having dared to do such a thing. I mean, that's... In, in China or here? <laughs> <laughs> You can see what they're worried about because obviously Osborne is worried that a left-wing Labour government might nationalise parts of our transport and power infrastructure so far better to give it all to the Chinese Communist Party (laughs) to prevent it from falling into the hands of the British public. (laughs) And let's face it, the Chinese do have an unrivaled safety record (laughs) as well. They all eat more pigs than any other country. <laughs> Sorry, they, they do what to pigs? They eat a lot more oh, they pigs. Eat them. Well, apparently there was a big state banquet and a waiter came up to Osborne and said, pork balls? He said, no, he's back in London, it's just me. <laughs> 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 it's Does, uh, <laughs> you know, when you go to number 11, you don't go in through that door. They say, oh, go through number 10, it's better. And you go inside and you realise there's no internal walls. It's like, you know, in Help, and the Beatles oh, have four yeah. separate front doors. Yeah. And you go inside, it's like a giant den. It's exactly like that, but with more pictures of Winston Churchill. <laughs> <laughs> you should have made him come into the BBC. You actually went round his house. Yeah, and, you know, we, we were let in. And then we just, they said, oh, well, you know, it's through then. You went, and there was this big red box like sitting on the table and you know it's like it's so hard to resist the urge just to grab it and run and just see what would happen (laughs) I I went to number 11 once it was some sort of charity reception and it was in a room upstairs and there were various celebrities around this is in the sort of what 10 years ago and I left this reception to go to the toilet and I walked in on a member of Liberty X doing a poo Now, that's a weird thing. If you're going somewhere that is... I mean, not that I'm a particular admirer of the Chancellor of the Exchequer, but if you're going somewhere quite high-profile that's very much at the heart of the establishment and the seat of power, wouldn't you go before you left the house? (laughs) If I were an American tourist thinking, oh, what is this Radio 4 I hear about? They'd just think this country is obsessed with with bottoms and willies and nothing else, and animals, ideally. I mean, and this is us talking about China. (laughs) (laughs) Well, talking of lavatories, I once, <laughs> I once came out... I was in a TV studio and I came out of a lavatory having, having done a, 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 something I'm not proud of. It was, <laughs> it was, it was a bad one. And, um, <laughs> and I came out thinking, oh, dear, pity whoever is in after me. And it was Donald Sutherland. <laughs> and I said, I'm very sorry, I've just made rather a horrible motion in there. <laughs> and... Uh, and he went in, and I was just washing my hands, and I said, uh, how is it in there? <laughs> and he said, it's pretty bad. Have you seen a doctor? <laughs> <laughs> Don't look now, indeed. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was wearing a red duffel coat as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, have you remembered which member of Liberty X it was that you... Not, not Shami Chakrabarty, surely. <laughs> <laughs> She's lovely. She'd always, Shami would always close the door. She's big on privacy. She's massive on privacy. <laughs> <laughs> Thrillingly, uh, George Osborne, the warm, caring face of the UK government, has been visiting China. Osborne wants China to be our second biggest trading partner, despite criticism over their human rights record, as opposed to our biggest trading partner, the USA, whose reputation in that area is, of course, completely spotless. (laughs) 
I saw in Lord Ashcroft's book that Barack Obama often doesn't remember Osborne's name and calls him Geoffrey. So, <laughs> so it makes sense that he prefers to be in China, where he's referred to much more formally as the English slave with the hair of a boy. <laughs> To help strengthen cultural links, the UK government is sending China a touring production of The Merchant of Venice. And I'm sure that we can all agree that nothing will strengthen cultural relations more than a play Shakespeare wrote about quite how much he hates foreigners. <laughs> the British Museum will also send China its exhibition, The History of the World in a Hundred Objects, which represents the most comprehensive collection of items we've ever stolen from other countries. <laughs> Two points to Samira. Jeremy, who's held a small gathering? Ah, the Lib Dems. Now, it is true to say that a space has opened up for the Lib Dems. A space called Oblivion. <laughs> Perhaps space is the wrong word. Perhaps black hole, vortex, abyss has opened up. And uh, the, the new star, their new leader, is, is Tim Farron. And uh, he decided to make a speech because, you know, they do that. And uh, it was, it was, he's opened very movingly, because they, they all like to do their biography, and he's had very humble origins, and he stood up and he talked about he was born a coal miner's daughter in a cabin on a hill in Butcher <laughs> Hollow. They were poor, but they had love. That's the one thing that Daddy made sure of. He gathered coal to earn a poor man's dollar. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, he did all that. And then this is rather odd thing happened, because... Um, what he did was he, he laid into the wickedness. He talked about the, the cold-blooded, heartless wickedness of the Tories and how much he was looking forward to propping them up in another coalition <laughs> in a few years' time. Now, this was the man who got all the credibility from not really backing the Liberals going in uh, to the coalition and voting against a lot of stuff and saying he gave it two out of ten. And now he was just singing the praises of what they did in the coalition. So it's just this bizarre speech about how um, the Liberals are uh, moderates, which basically means they're anybody's. Anybody, <laughs> anybody's for a seat in government. It was quite... It was a well-delivered speech, though. I oh, yeah, it was, it was you know, yeah. It was that bit at the end where it was like, the, you know, generals were advised to march their troops towards the sound of gunfire. Well, troops, I hear gunfire. And I was like, oh, bloody, I'm turned on. I don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> and, of course, he, his, his guns were rather spiked, because he'd been... At the minute Jeremy Corbyn got him, uh, he started talking about... He was getting loads of text messages from the Labour right, and there were going to be defections, and we were all wondering which defective right-wing Labour MPs it was going to be. <laughs> but everyone was very excited. They were all... They were, the Liberals were all very, very, very excited because they're back in their comfort zone of powerlessness. <laughs> Shouting into the wilderness about the unfairness of things, so they're all right. I once got kicked out of the Liberal Democrats. I joined for a joke. Um, <laughs> I was, it, was, it was when I was writing a gossip newspaper diary, and uh, they had that leadership contest uh, where everyone running for the leadership was either an alcoholic or secretly gay or had been found doing unspeakable things with rent boys in a bath, and it was just, it was just a fiasco. And, you, and I discovered... It was, it's a bit like what happened recently with, with the Labour Party, but I discovered you could join for £6 and get a vote in the leadership election. So I joined the party and wrote about it in the column. And, uh, and they phoned me up the next day and they said, uh, we want to know if you're going to bring the party into disrepute. And I said, is it obligatory? <laughs> uh, and they didn't find that funny at all. And they, and they kicked me out. <laughs> he quoted Jenny Mitchell as well, didn't he? Yeah. He did, He said, yeah. he said uh, was it, doesn't it always seem to go that you don't know what you've got till it's gone? Which is, of course from Big Yellow Taxi, which is what the electorate told them to leave in. <laughs> yeah. so, a little unwise. No, he's yeah. based quite a lot of policy on the song Big Yellow Taxi. Also uh, aims to build 300,000 new homes by paving paradise. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, so do you think it was a good atmosphere at the, at the conference, considering everything? Or was it more like a sort of post-funeral Did all reception? eight MPs turn up? Yeah, yeah, they all came in one, one van. Yeah. Yeah. One, 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 one big yellow taxi. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But did all the, lab, the, the Liberal MPs stand what in the leadership do? thing? Because I read somewhere, it was quite. It said, uh, it said he's breaking with tradition by not appointing a kind of shadow cabinet. And I thought, well, it would be quite difficult. <laughs> be shadow yeah. minister for stuff, <laughs> shadow minister for various other stuff, shadow minister for miscellaneous. Yeah, it'd be like Andram, where you have to, you go, you're in the chorus, but you're also Macbeth. <laughs> 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 Uh, sensationally, this is the Lib Dem conference, which was held, appropriately enough, in Bournemouth, where so many things go at the end of their lives. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
The new leader, Tim Farron, made a speech setting out his party's plans to become a dynamic force in the centre ground of British politics, which was rapturously received by both the audience. <laughs> he claimed Lib Dems were now the only credible alternative to the Conservatives, seemingly forgetting the sweet release of death. <laughs> Labour politicians have been offered a home with the Liberal Democrats, which is a bit like finding a puppy huddled in an alleyway and rehoming it in a wheat thresher. <laughs> Farron claims that many MPs don't recognise the Labour Party anymore, although if you're having trouble spotting, it's the one with the website covered in pictures of Chairman Mao. <laughs> he claimed there are millions of people in Britain who know in their hearts that they are Liberals. The thing there, Tim, is that the word Liberals is tarnished a bit when you stick the word Democrats onto the end of it like adding zero onto the end of coke, or laxative onto the end of chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> Two points to Jeremy. Uh, and at the end of round one, the scores are Hugo and Lucy have four, and so too to Samira and Jeremy. <laughs> and we start round two with a cutting from The Times. A gardener whose first homegrown courgette grew to seven feet has preserved it and mounted it in her garden shed. <laughs> Thanks to Dick Carlion for sending us that filth. <laughs> Hugo, who's feeling not so much isolated as is elated? That is, that is brilliant. <laughs> This, this, this is probably about this, members of the Islamic State who want to come home, people who've left Britain to go and fight for the Islamic State. There's a, a terrorism think tank this week, which is a sort of terrifying phrase, but apparently advises us on how to deal with terrorists, not advises terrorists on how to be better terrorists. <laughs> this, a terrorism think tank has said Britain should do more to welcome home people who want to come back from fighting for the Islamic State because it should be easier for them to defect and return. But uh, apparently lots of people who do go and fight for IS in Syria do end up wanting to come home because it's not very nice there. The thing that upsets them most of all, though, isn't all the kind of sort of murdering they do of everybody else. It's the fact that they're apparently just not very nice to each other. Uh, and they're, they're sort of, their IS brethren are just not suitably respectful and, and charming. There was a guy, in fact, in the papers just the other week, Omar Hussein, who used to work in Morrison's, apparently, uh, but, but now works for the Islamic State, which is possibly a promotion, I'm not sure. Um, but um, he was... Um, he was, uh, he was complaining um, that his, his brothers-in-arms, uh, he, he, like, he didn't get on with them at all. He said they were all animals. They picked on him. They wouldn't sit down when they ate. They stole his shoes. And he was also very upset, uh, not, not that they throw gay people off buildings, but that they occasionally take his phone off the charger. And, and this was enough for him to write this sort of furious denouncing blog about how nasty they all were, although he's not coming back. Um, yeah, so it's basically this idea that we ought to be doing more to welcome home the Islamic State fighters. I've got a theory that, you know, the government said they're going to take in 20,000 Syrian refugees from camps in Turkey. So you're bringing over families who've you know, genuinely been displaced. And I just thought, what if you just made any returning IS jihadists sit down with one of these families and just shut up and listen to them? And that would be a condition of them coming back. Could just putting it out there. Just a sort of Radio 4 appeal. You know, got... <laughs> would you like jihadists would... to come to your house? <laughs> Force them to listen to the Archer's omnibus. For hours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it is. I think that's actually a genuinely amazing idea. You know, that because it is all the it's the stuff that they're complaining about. It, it, hard toilet paper. Yeah. Number well, that one. is. It, oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, peculiarly, this is a study from King's College into the reasons why people who joined IS changed their minds and left. The publishers collated evidence from first-hand accounts by jihadists and one particularly scathing review on TripAdvisor. <laughs> In many ways, the defecting of members is typical of the problems that face any small organisation that expands too quickly. Uh, my advice to IS, and I know they're waiting for it, is to organise a few corporate away days, uh, perhaps a Christmas bonus scheme, not, well, not, not Christmas, obviously, but some sort of <laughs> parallel, and also to try and make those on the lower rungs feel that even if they're not actively executing people, they're still very much part of the team. Um, two points to Hugo. Lucy. Who has been getting themselves in a bit of the States? This uh, is a story about my, this may be controversial, but my current crush. I've got a big thing for the Pope. Um, I love, I absolutely properly love him. He is single. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, never let it be said I go for unattainable men. Uh, you know. <laughs> uh, yes, so uh, Pope Francis has gone over to America and is wowing the crowds. It was all a bit tense before he went over there. They were all, they were all worried, basically. The Republicans were thinking, you know, they're wondering if he's going to attack them over climate change. The Democrats are wondering if he'd bring up the equal marriage laws. Donald Trump was wondering if he could find the Pope's birth certificate and prove he's actually a Muslim. Um, <laughs> so because he arri- immediately he arrives, he's cool. He had a little tiny black Fiat waiting for him, not one of these big SUVs that everyone else was driving. He gets into his little Fiat. And the, the Americans' minds were blown by this. But no, it's just he was making a point about, you know, not being a, a sort of excessive consumer. And he has been determined to emphasise the importance of humility from the tiny car to having lunch with the homeless. He's kind of, he's like Jeremy Corbyn in a frock. Um, <laughs> but generally, the impression has been that he's been kind of quite left-leaning in his, in his views, leading some Republicans to be furious there was one Republican I heard saying that he should butt out of politics. You know, his infallibility applies to spiritual, not political matters. And it was just lovely to hear a Republican saying that religion and politics shouldn't be uh, combined. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so it's a, he's amazingly charismatic, whatever you think of him. He's a bit more controversial than that, though, isn't he? So, you know, the, the Catholic bishops have had a huge scandal with child, historic child abuse, and he praised the courage of bishops for how they'd handle that, which gone down that well with survivors of child sex abuse and you know the man the, the um the man who's going to um canonize um mm. Junipero Serra the Franciscan who set up all those missions he used yeah. to work for the Spanish Inquisition yeah <laughs> and, and how involved. old is he <laughs> <laughs> and and is believed to be very much involved in the reason that most of the Native Americans were virtually wiped out by yeah. disease because of all that forced labor and torture. A lot of syphilis. Missions. A lot of so bit. apart from that... Apart from all those things, absolutely wonderful guy. Uh, won't hear what I like about the Pope is, I mean, he makes it all look very easy, Poping, doesn't he? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not happy about his, his abandoning of the Popemobile, though. I was a big fan of Popemobiles. But I remember I once had to research Popemobiles for an article, and it's fascinating, the history of Popemobiles. One of the earliest... Popemobiles was designed with gun turrets uh, for some state visit because they because it was going to be somewhere where they thought he might be under attack. But the Vatican ruled out gun turrets because they decided that it wouldn't look good for the Pope to shoot back. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, sacramentally, this is the visit of the Pope to the United States, where he made remarks about climate change, which were seen as controversial by those Americans who believe the Pope is God's divine and infallible representative on Earth, but who find climate change a bit of a stretch. <laughs> It's hard to take issue with anything the Pope says because doctrinally he is never wrong, uh, which is why he remains the reigning champion on the Vatican City's version of Trivial Pursuit. Um, (laughs) Doesn't matter what it says on the back of the card, mate, let's just all remind ourselves which one of us is the Pope. (laughs) Uh, Two points to Lucy. Samira, why is the apocalypse now? Um, Oh, this is to do with Doomsday. So there there is a place in Svalbard, Norway, which is called the Doomsday Vault, and it's a store of all the seed samples of all kinds of plants from around the world in case there's some kind of disaster. And it sort of has happened to some extent. There used to be a big uh, sort of gene bank for seeds in Aleppo in Syria, which, of course, has been overrun by IS. And they they moved it to Beirut, but basically they've lost a whole load of samples. And um, they've put in a request to the seed bank, this uh, doomsday vault, for 116,000 um, of samples, things like wheat and barley and grasses, which are all samples from those, those dry lands. Um, and the Norwegians have said, well, no, this is good, because this is what we're there for. You know, just nice, nice to... You <laughs> mentioned the first time the phone was rung. <laughs> You've got a big order, guys. <laughs> so, uh, so this, they're going to send the seed samples out. I don't know how long it takes, though. And if you're not in, they'll just leave a little card through the box. <laughs> yeah. it's, uh, it's where, so it's in the Arctic? This, anyone... Svalbard. Yep. 800 miles from the North Pole. And everyone, everyone's got a place there. I, didn't, I mean, I didn't know this existed until this <laughs> I think story. It's but shared, before... isn't it? And, and because it's so cold... A shed? It's shared. Oh, sorry. It's not just, just a shed. A shed. <laughs> <laughs> big long name like that. That's a bit disappointing. It's a very yeah, big shed. 800 it's miles across shed. the Arctic. Oh, it's a shed. But it's so cold that even if um, the electricity breaks down the seeds would remain frozen for 200 years. Crikey bananas. <laughs> That's a good backup system, isn't it? I wonder how they know. I know, it's, it's a, it must be, it's just a big freezer, really, isn't it? It must be like any, it's like, you know, my freezer. There's probably things they've forgotten what they are. They've got a mislabeled Tupperware going, well, it could be seeds, could be casserole. We <laughs> could don't be know. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's, ama- and, you know, yes, it's an amazing resource. Because can we go? Can we go and visit and have a look? Well, and see lots of seeds. <laughs> I mean, is, is, that, is that fun? I mean, Just take some out. You've got to be prepared to invest the, the money and the time to visit 
what, what sounds like a shed with some seeds in it the other side. <laughs> I, hope they, I hope they put little stickers on the bags before they've frozen because seeds are much of a muchness to look at. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to make sense of all that in years to come, working out the marigolds from the barley and things like that. Do you think every now and then they have to do like a big defrost with a hairdryer? <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, here we go again. It's... I suppose if the Pope went to the seed bank and was outside, you wouldn't be able to see him, would you? Oh. <laughs> it's my dream. Yeah. This is my dream. <laughs> Pope shed some seed. What a story. <laughs> <laughs> you would think, and I, you know, I don't wish to always lower the tone, but you would think sperm would be a good thing to put in there. Because if it is, it's in the event of the apocalypse, isn't it? If we need to sort of regenerate the planet. Oh, you assume that the women are going to survive, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at you, Jeremy. I'm not sure how... Uh, are you like a cockroach? <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean he's like a cockroach. I just well, wondered... you're not getting any of my jizz, Lolly, I'm telling you that. <laughs> Hardy by name. <laughs> Bonus point to Jeremy for the use of the word jizz, Lolly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm writing that down. So, well, that's had an impact on the scores. Um... <laughs> Uh, bleakly, this is the news that scientists have travelled to the Svalbard Global Seed Vault in the Arctic to retrieve vital seed stocks stored in the event of a global disaster. The seeds are to replace a seed bank damaged in the ongoing Syrian civil war, so that should sort things out over there. <laughs> The vault was constructed in the Arctic, just in case there's a massive worldwide apocalypse that has somehow not affected one's ability to travel to the Arctic. <laughs> It's good to know that if civilization is wiped out and the world is reduced to a smoking wasteland, there'll still be a place to go for a bowl of muesli. <laughs> seeds from all over the world have been locked in the vault, except, of course, for the lightning seeds, who remain at large to delight us forever. Um, keep your promise, lads. Don't ever change. Uh, two points to Samira. Jeremy, have a listen to this. What a timely reminder of the power of music. Um, <laughs> Jeremy, who's building a bridge to a, a sporting future? Um, I don't know who that was. Can you tell us who it was, by the way? Uh, Cher? OK. Um... <laughs> uh, uh, Chrissy Hine and Nina Cherry. OK. Well, it's bridge, isn't it? Uh, people who run bridge, whoever runs the bridge, I don't know, the Illuminati or the <laughs> Build a Bridge group, one of those people, um, they are irate that Sport England do not recognise bridge as a sport on the pretext of the fact that it plainly is a card game. <laughs> um, yeah. Where no one gets out of breath or chucks anything or gets <laughs> a sweaty groin or puts on special things. But Bridge has been involved in, in some cheating scandals recently, which is quite sporty. They have been involved in some cheating scandals that they've been doing random sanatogen tests. <laughs> um, a couple of people tested positive for fibre gel as well. <laughs> But they said uh, the, the, the bridge, the, the, the barrister sort of sneered, well, darts is a sport and it's no more energetic lifting pints than it is shuffling cars. I thought, yeah, but actually, accurately throwing a dart when you're that drunk <laughs> takes quite a lot of muscular control, whereas simply sitting, playing bridge, wondering whether you're going to live past lunch <laughs> is not... <laughs> It's not cardiovascular, <laughs> shall we say, is it? My, my granny used to play bridge, and for years I thought that all bridge was, it was just like snap. But instead of saying snap, you said bridge. <laughs> <laughs> is it not even that much fun? <laughs> Apparently that's not true, no. There something... is something in the, that it is, uh, they were saying, well, at least it's a sport for old people, and there's not that many sports that old people can readily take part in. <laughs> there was this guy this week who's been doing all the Olympics while being old, wasn't there? Did you see that? This 80-year-old guy is doing pole vaulting and running and I hope somebody else knows about this. This is all I've got. But um, <laughs> he was definitely in the newspaper. Old man, pole vaulting. Come on. I didn't dream this. I can't dream this. I want to see it. It would be good. Well, yeah, I find I it. The older is... I get, the funnier it gets when I exercise. It's be, it's when I go to the gym now, it's hilarious. The noises I make, the things that come out, it's all hilarious. <laughs> 
It's only going to get better. This, this man, Hugo, that only you have... Yes. <laughs> yeah. your, your sort of dream man. He, he's competing not against anyone else. He's just doing events on himself. I only saw the pictures. I don't know. Uh, I, I was in a meeting about it. I wasn't paying attention. There was a meeting about I'm it? I'm going to get in trouble. <laughs> Vexingly, this is the ongoing struggle to get Sport England to recognise Bridge as a sport. Uh, yes, we've banged on about geopolitics and corporate scandals, but mention Bridge and suddenly the audience stirs arthritically into life. Um, <laughs> people say Bridge doesn't get you fit, but let me assure you, nothing gets the heart racing like a group of bullies chasing you home from Bridge Club. <laughs> Of course, bridge will never be embraced as a British national sport until we can watch it abroad while systematically destroying a restaurant. <laughs> it's been suggested that bridge becoming a sport could help tackle childhood obesity. I guess because if people are constantly playing bridge, they won't have time to feed their fat children. <laughs> uh, two points to Jeremy. Uh, before we reveal the all-important final scores, has anybody got a cutting they'd like to share? Hugo. Uh, this has been sent in by Ben Cooper, and it's from Yoga Newsletter, and it's advertising uh, Yoga for Anxiety. And it says, if you are not able to come to our Yoga for Anxiety workshops, don't worry. <laughs> Lucy. Pauline McGurty, thank you, Pauline, has sent this one in, and it's from the Horsham and Southwater Free Cycle site. Excellent thing, Free Cycle. And someone is offering on this free site a fancy dress penguin suit. And their description is just the cutest thing ever. It says, Outfit has hood with eyes and beak, so the wearer's face is not covered, and yellow feet that elastic over the top of wearer's shoes. Also, red bow tie, but that could be removed if a more serious penguin look was required. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy uh, This is from Liam Ashby uh, who sent it in and it's from the ITV News website A unique interactive map which shows the location and severity of road collisions over the past decade was so popular that it crashed soon after launch <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And so let us take a look at the final <laughs> score. And we see that Hugo and Lucy have eight, uh, but Samira and Jeremy have nine. <laughs> Before we leave you, here is a cutting from the Hanstanton Town and Around newsletter sent in by Rod Butcher. Some 2,000 visitors have gone through the door at the Heritage Centre since we opened two years ago this month. Visitors have come from as far away as Australia, Ukraine and Kettering. <laughs> and with that, goodbye. <laughs> Taking part in the news quiz were Hugo Rifkin, Lucy Porter, Samira Ahmed and Jeremy Hardy. In the chair was Miles Jupp and the news was read by me, Kathy Clugston. The chair's script was written by Max Davis, John Hunter and James Kettle with additional material by Liam Byrne and Claire Wetton. The producer was Richard Morris and it was a BBC radio comedy production. Thank <laughs> you.